Welcome to WordStream Live with Pastor Howard Carpenter. Hello, everyone, and welcome to WordStream Live's weekly Bible study. We're currently in uh, Paul's epistle, epistle to the Ephesians, chapter 4. And I tell you what, before we get started, let's just uh, go to the Lord in prayer for a moment. Father, we just uh, seek your will, Lord. We, we pray, oh God, that we have uh, ears to hear. Father, I ask for your divine help, Lord, to speak uh, clearly. Father, to speak boldly. Father, to communicate a rightly divided word, Lord, that you are glorified. Father, the church be edified. We seek your will to be accomplished, Lord, in each of us. Pray it be done in Jesus' name. Amen. Our key verse uh, in our passage today is from Paul's exhortation right off in, in verse 1 where he says, Therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, imploring, imploring the church, implore, imploring you and I to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which we have been called. This is, and this is actually consistent with Paul's letters to other churches where he's marking it with that word, therefore, marking a transition from what he spent all these chapters, what God had done for us and in us and bringing, him, bringing uh, ourselves to him, to Christ. And now to transition into what the church is to do, what the church, the church's response to what God has done. He's given it to us in doctrine, and now it, it is to be lit, played out in our lives by duty, if you will, by what we do in obedience to, to Christ. Paul spent 11 chapters in the, in the letter to the Romans uh, def with doctrine defining what God had done. And then in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, he makes that tra transition where he says, Therefore I urge you, brother, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies unto, unto him as a, living, as a holy and living sacrifice, acceptable unto God, which is, your, which is our spiritual service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may know, that you may prove what is the good, good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So that's what, that's the process that occurs. He did this again in Colossians in chapter 3, verse 5, transition. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, transition. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1, he says, and finally then, brethren, making the trans transition, we, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that you that as you have received from us instruction on how to walk, now please God just as you actually do. In other words, they were showing growth. They were showing a manifestation of the work of God in their lives, walking in, in obedience to him. And then he says, and still excel even more. In other words, continue to grow, continue to develop, to, to, to continue to, uh, to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Last week, I mentioned in chapter 3, verse 14, that marked Paul beginning this kind of a, what I call a transition to transition from God's doctrine to Christian duty, that he prayed that they be strengthened with power through the, his spirit in the inner man so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. It was a preparation for today's transition because living a life worthy of the calling begins and ends with as summarized last week by spending more time feeding the inner man rather than the outer man that were being led by the spirit of god so that through christ that through faith christ would dwell in our hearts the center of our hearts uh we're submitting ourselves under his rule his his Christ being directed, rather than Christ being just an addendum to our life, he's the center of our life. And that thirdly, that we live by the only law we need, and that is the law of love. And our theme today is about going beyond what God says, we are to doing what he says. Uh, I have an exercise room downstairs, do, do, doesn't do any good if I don't do something with it. It's the same thing. He wants us to do in response to what he has done. Doctrine says we are holy, but we're to be holy in all our behavior. In other words, that would be a response. Doctrine says that we're light, and to, to be light, to be a light that is truly not hidden. 
Doctrine says that we're to be salt, that we're to be salty. Are we salty? Are we actually influencing the sphere in which we live? A gentleman by the name of C, C or I'm sorry, G. K. Chesterton. He, the guy never went to college. Well-known journalist, well-known author, and they, in articles about him, they make that point that he never went to college, but was often referred to the greatest American thinker of the 21st of the 20th century. And he wrote extensively in apologetics and said that the Christian ideal is a uh, provocative statement. He says the Christian Christian ideal has not been has been has not been tried, hasn't been tested. Now, obviously, he's looking through the lens in the period in which he's living, and he sees the church has been tried, has, has not been, has, hasn't even been tried, and and and, is, and, he, and it has been found wanting. It has been difficult. It has been found difficult and left untried. He didn't see, he saw it lacking. He didn't see it being what the scripture would, would define it to be. It hasn't even been tested. He's already, he's already determined, already judged it to be deficient, substandard after his review. He says it's not living up to the expectations that God expresses in his word. My initial response to that seemed that it seemed to me, even to me, <laughs> a little bit harsh. But he, but it reminded me of a comment that I just heard recently from an influential pastor and author in in our in our time, who made a similar statement where he said few Christians measure up to what Paul described in Ephesians three that they would then live a life worthy of the calling to which they have been called, and they're just the the statements just seem tough. But when you read this and you see this and you see what's required and you see the order in which it's uh, laid out, you start to see. And then when you look at the, uh, the landscape around us, you, you can begin to see the basis for some of these uh, very tough comments. The tenor of his words suggested to me there's a time, it's time now, per perhaps more than that, uh, to, to put up or shut up. It's another way of saying enough time has been spent talking about what God has done, not that you ever stop talking, but to do only that and never make that transition to actually walk, to actually walk in the manner, according to the manner, uh, according to measuring up to the standards of God. It, there's a point where it has to be done. It's the same principle that you see in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, and I've, and I've used this many times over the years, test yourselves to see whether or not you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or, and Paul goes on, or do you not recognize this about yourselves? Do you not recognize that Jesus Christ is in you? Or don't you recognize that? Are you doing a test and seeing that he's not? He says, unless indeed you fail the test. But I trust that you will realize that we ourselves, speaking of himself and his compadres, we ourselves do not fail the test. In other words, it's not to be failed. It is to be lived out, as in that test uh, implies, that the reality of that change in us is manifested. They had a lot to say, these Corinthians. They boasted a lot. They criticized a lot. But to Paul, regarding the relationship with Christ, it was time to put up or show up. Or put up, well, they needed to show up, put up or shut up. It's time to transition beyond just discussing and talking, but showing the evidence, showing the proof, the fruit of a changed life. And this is consistent with, just briefly, because God knows I, I ramble, that Jesus had some pretty harsh words to two of the, to the last two churches that he spoke to, where he had harsh words, two of the last three he talked to. But two of those three were pretty harsh words. To Sardis, he said to them, look at you guys have a reputation of being alive. And he went on to say to them, wake up, strengthen the things that remain, which were about to die, for I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. In other words, they, they have this show. They do, they do all this stuff. And he said, look, they're not complete. You're deficient. You're lacking. You have a reputation of being alive, but in reality, you're dead. And he said to Sardis, the lukewarm and indifferent, not Sardis, but allowed to see in church, who, who said of themselves, I have, we have need of nothing. Yet the Lord challenged their empty boast by telling them, describing them as wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. They were empty. They were not living a life worthy of the calling to which they've been called. So read with me uh, in our text today, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. Paul says, 
Therefore, I, a prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Now, we're not going to cover all this as I had planned. In fact, it was a quarter to six. I sat down and, and just kind of threw, every, threw it, uh, rearranged because things just weren't clear. And I got to, it, the, the sense came to me tonight's a transition, another transition, if you will, between uh, uh, chapters three and four, uh, chapter three, verse 14, and what Paul is talking about here, it, because it, it supports this very contention about uh, there's a time to stop, to shut up. And, and, and do as as Paul is implying, as, as those other gentlemen that I mentioned were implying. When Paul uses that phrase, "walk in a manner worthy worthy of the calling to which you've been called," he, he likely has in mind that, that picture of the the balance scales. You have the scales on each side, and if they're equal, if they're even, then you have balance. They're 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 right, and that's what that's what pretty much what he's talking about. They should be in balance. What God has been done has done here has has gravitas has weight all that doctrine that displays all that He has done for us and through us, like I said. And on the other side is our response to God, and it ought to it ought to match up. There ought to be some balance in what we do in our response to what God has done. We it, in 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 our conduct in in how we talk, the use of our time. The use of our talents, the use of what God has given us. Job didn't repeat, didn't retreat from those scales. In Job chapter th thirty-one, he did, speaks of it of himself, and he's in the most dire circumstances of his life. He's lost everything, even his health. And he says in in Job thirty-one verse six through eight, "Let him, i.e., God, let him weigh me with accurate scales, because he knows with God they'll be just, they'll be accurate. He doesn't want man doing it." Paul he just said to you. If, uh, in uh, First Corinthians, he told that very church, "If you're gonna, you're, it's a little thing to me if you judge me." He, but uh, in this case, Job wants God to judge him. Let him weigh me with accurate scales, and let God know my integrity, because God's already declared it blameless early in the first chapter. If my step has turned from my, if my step has turned from my way, or my heart followed my eyes, or if any spot has stuck to my hands, let me sow and another eat. Let my crops be a root. In other words, if my self-assessment is wrong and I've actually done these things, then let God give me, bring into my life the consequences I deserve because I know that he's a just God. But he had the confidence to do so. Would we have that same confidence? Would our conscience be clear? Then that doesn't make us innocent, Paul said to that same Corinthian church. Belshazzar is an exa another example in Daniel chapter 5. Daniel says to him, in, in verse 27, you have been weighed in the balance and have been found wanting, meaning his life reflect God gives him an opportunity. There's an opportunity here for him to get right with God. And his response is to, essentially to keep praising the gods of gold and silver. He did not respond to, to, to what, God, uh, what Daniel said to him of, of the effect of, of God intervening in Nebuchadnezzar's life. And this man becoming a man of faith who was the king of Babylon. Belshazzar, his son or his grandson, he wasn't even responding. wasn't responding. He was willing to pay Daniel for giving him the the uh, uh, the interpretation of a of a dream of a vision, but he didn't want to respond to it. So he was found wanting. His, his scale was empty. There was nothing there. And the false prophets of Matthew seven really illustrate this because they were found walking. The works they did did nothing. The scales were empty in their life. Jesus said to them, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? And in the context of false prophets, he's asking, he's at, he says to them, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you men you men who practice lawlessness. And to me, that's a phenomenal statement. 
In other words, they had God has presented the gospel, and here's their response. Their response is a is miracles. Their their response is prophecies. Their response is to actually name the Lord, giving credit to the Lord and their ministry. And yet it is empty. Why? Because they never came to God as he laid out in the scriptures. They were presenting to everybody a broad way. They were doing other things. And the point of it is, one can be fully engaged in ministry, but it has no value. It has no weight in response to what God has done if they're not coming to God as one is to come to God. And there is also, as we'll see next week, Lord willing, in a number of passages for the believer, if he's walking in the flesh and doing all these works of ministry, it won't balance out as it ought to. It doesn't mean one loses their salvation because they don't. If one is converted, they're, they're not going to lose it. But that doesn't mean there's going to be profit at the end of the day. It doesn't mean that they, they don't enter the kingdom of God as if through fire. It, it doesn't mean that the, that the welcome into heaven in 2 Peter 3 that, or 2 Peter 1, the, the welcome is as rich as you would like it to be because they're short-sighted. So it has to, it's supposed to weigh out. Look at, respond to God the best you can by the power of, of, of his spirit in the manner in which I've ordained you to do and called you to do. Motivational speakers like these guys that, he's, that I would refer to are behind pulpits, will feed you what will tickle your ears, but will deprive you of eternal life. Comedians and storytellers will uh, help you laugh or cry and stir your emotions, but will deprive you of eternal life and will provide nothing to avoid the gnashing of teeth. Diotrephes is another example in, in principle of a, a response. Here, this guy is, is in the church in 3, 3 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. He says, Blood, you are acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren. And especially when they are strangers and they have testified to your love before the church. You do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. For they went out for the sake of my name, of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentile. Therefore, we have to support such uh, men so that we may be fellow workers with the truth. So John's sending a letter to affirm the church, helping these ministers, these missionaries, if you will, who are moving, uh, moving around in the area. Help them uh, give out the truth. But it didn't go that way. Even though this was the fitting and right thing to do, a man are worthy of the count, the worthy, because he says, these fellow workers of the truth by sending them on their way in a manner worthy of God. That's what they were trying to do. They, they wanted to. Many of the church wanted to do so. And John affirms it. But it wasn't happening for two reasons, reflected in verse 9. I wrote, in other words, John the Apostle's talking. He says, I wrote something to the church. But Diotrephes, who loves to be the first among them, the preeminent one, the most important guy in town, does not accept what we say. This leader, this elder, this uh, pastor named Diotrephes, just he was the he was the imperative of the church. I'm what's most important in the church. What I say to do is what's going to be done, and he, and that last statement really lays it out. Does not accept what we say. What a flagrant, what flagrant rebellion to the word of God in, in, in a man who says, I will not accept what the apostles doctrine, what the word coming from God through these men, these, these men, and does not accept what he had to say, what he had to say. He would, on those scales, he would be found wanting, want, lacking, because he was not walking in obedience, surely not in a manner worthy of the gospel. Of God. Now I'm dwelling on this because because if one isn't careful, this is the crux. The ABCs that I see here in in, uh, in this whole from three fourteen on through four six and even further, as we'll see later on, Lord willing, there are these each of these steps has impact. They all they all relate. They all factor in in what Paul's speaking about in these in these chapters. And there's three essentially three commands, three imperatives that the believer, you and I have to align with. And I'm going to call those for the sake of this, the starting blocks, the, the starting block, the, um, what do I call it? The, the, the race or the walk, if you will, and the, the finish line. 
And the starting blocks in verse, is chapter 3, verse 16, where he says to be strengthened with power through the spirit of the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with the fullness of God. So you have to be filled with the spirit of God. You have to be filled with God. That's the goal throughout our entire life. Whatever's happening in our life, our goal is to walk full of the spirit. That if, we, that if we're full of the spirit, we're walking in the spirit. And subsequently, we're not carrying out the desires of the flesh. And that when we grieve the spirit of God, that we don't let that go long, that we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God and deal with the things that grieve the spirit, which would be our sin, our, our disobedience, our rebellion. And Paul, it, and that has to be for us to be affected in our walk, to be edified, and our walk for the church around us to be edified. He might even challenge some of us to put up or shut up in discussions about making Christ the Lord of our lives, our hearts yielding to his authority as king. That he's not just, as I said earlier, just a byword in our lives, on the periphery, on the outside boundaries, of, in the back room. But he's the center of our lives. We're dwelling in us. We're making room for him to be the center of our lives. And we want to make sure that that is such that it's in parity, it's in balance with what the Lord demands. Just like his demand, his imperative that we be filled with the Spirit. And if there's ever a place where we need to put up or shut up is in the ground that we are rooted in a love that surpasses knowledge, that that is put into play. And I don't mean that sappy love born of emotions that extends to those who are already close or are lovable, but the love that is spent and spent and expended again in the sacrifice of oneself for the benefit of another. It's, it's not conditional, it's unconditional. There is no quid pro quo in love. And then the walk, therefore, I'm a prisoner of the Lord. I implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. The strength is provided to do so. The real work now begins in, in, in producing that, which is what I'm going to call here the, the finish line, the full expression. Because walking in a manner, walking in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called can only be done by what, what occurred back there at the starting blocks. That's where it begins. So if we don't bring that forward, this won't happen. And if that doesn't, if that doesn't happen, we're not going to live that life worthy of the calling. And we're surely not going to, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. It'll never happen. In fact, if we look at all three of them, I'd go right to the, look what the outcome you desire. The outcome is that you be diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. See, that's the goal. That's ultimate finish line in this section right here. That's what you're looking to do. Now, you step back from that. Step back from that and all that's, re, all that's required for that to occur. Obviously, it started back there about being filled with the Spirit and all those, those three things there in the starting blocks. But right here where he said, with all humility. Now, we're, see, we'd like to go directly to verse 7 where it starts talking about the task. talks about the work that we do, the ministry we're in. I could be this, I could be that, I could be this. That's what I want to do. I'm going to show God. Yes, that would be part of the scale. But I tell you what, if that, that part of our lives, our walk, is filled with a bunch of tasks without the fruit of the Spirit, without the work of the Spirit working in these areas that are in the inner man that no one can see until they're manifested. That work, that's the work that we'll see in those passages next week. That's where the work of God has to be for the work to be profitable, for the work to be effective, for the work to be there at the end of the day, at the end of the race and not burned up. That there has to be with all humility and gentleness. I tell you, these things don't come easy. Humility, gentleness, that's not the way of the world. The way of the world, come on, get it done. I'm asserting myself. It's just the opposite. Our power that we have through the Spirit of God is control. We have self-control. 
We're listening to the voice of the Spirit. We're reading His Word. We're nourished in His Word. We're learning the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We're taking a step according to the will of God. We're moving as He directs. And then with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love. That's why we'll spend some time. That's, what that's the focus next. But this is a transition to it. And I'm trying to, to, to emphasize the critical nature of these different blocks of Scripture and how they relate. That what we are looking for here, and everybody's looking for verse 7 about the, or even in 1 Corinthians, Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, a manifestation of the Spirit. But the comment, I want that manifestation of the Spirit. Don't talk to me about humility. I'm, I'm humble. That's kind of the response. And God's got to do that work in us. There's a reason Moses, when he came, I'm ready. These people know I'm ready to deliver them. And God had to send him 40 years to learn to be the most humble man in the world. There had to be a work in him, a work, a work in you and I, a work still. It's ongoing, ongoing throughout our walk, that walk to become more and more conformed to the image of God, more and more an imitator a Paul, more and more imitator of Christ, as Paul was an imitator, a man that had the had the the audacity to say, "Imitate me as I imitate Christ." Relaying to us, yes, it is possible. Yes, it is a walk. Doesn't mean perfect, because no man outside of Christ walked perfect. Can't just can't jump. To the task. Can't jump to the show. You can't jump to the platform, to the pulpit. There has to be a work of preparation through the Spirit of God and the man of God being nourished by a woman of God, being nourished by the Word of God and operating not for self. I have this what God has given to be used to edify the church. Otherwise, it's not going to be so so profitable. And I'm going to skip a whole lot of this, as I already expected. But there has to be to, to, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which we've been called. We have to value it. It's kind of hard to even respond for, for some who don't value what God has done. If, are they are, are you and I weighing what God has done? I said this back in the very beginning in Ephesians 1. What God has done in, in terms of calling us to himself, his, the forgiveness that we received through Christ, we've been adopted into the family of God. Our sins are as far from, from, uh, from us as for the east as from the west. And that we are secured in a relationship with God. That he who began the work will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. So we have all what God has done on this scale, a mighty work, a powerful work, an eternal work. A work that no longer left us dead in our sins, but has made us alive in Christ. And that alive in Christ ought to reflect with parity and balance before Almighty God. Is that what it ought to be? And the reality is, often it is not. Often it is not. Let's just look at David for a moment in, in uh, Psalms 51. The man, in the wake of his, the heinous sin that the man committed, the man who was heart was after God, a man that God looked, up, looked upon him and selected him to be king, looking upon the heart of this man rather than the outward appearance, says, and David said, create in me, O God, a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. This is the heart of a man who's responding to what he knows to be, what he knows to be a, a, a long-suffering, merciful God. Create me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right step that spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, O oh God, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. See, he transitioned there from telling God, telling God what his response would be to what God would do. And that's how his response. Now, this is how he responds in verse 13. What he's got, his response to what he believes God will do. In response, he says, and then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. See, he understands what God is doing for him 
has done for him and wants to respond in just that way, what God wants him to do. It's the same, and I think I said this before from Luke 17, I don't remember which account. When Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, these 10 guys show up, these 10 lepers, and they raise their voices, Jesus, Master, they got the right words, have mercy on us. So he saw them. He said, go show yourself to the priest. In other words, may they, 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 that they would declare them healed. And before they even got there, they were they were healed. Now one of them, now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, glorified God with a loud voice. Then Jesus answered and said, were there not 10 cleansed? But the nine, where, where's the nine? Or is there no response from them? Do they not value what I've done in their lives? Was no one found who returned to give glory to God except the foreigner outside of Israel? Israel wasn't responding. Of course, he came into his own and his own received him not. They were the ones that didn't receive him. Could it be that Chesterson was not being, not just being cynical? Only 10%, a mere few that thought, maybe they thought they deserved healing. Maybe they thought, you know, I'm not like other people. I, I, this should never have happened to me. I've seen other people heal them. Why not me? Who knows what? Who knows why people would respond to such a thing as being healed of leprosy? How about you and I? We've been dead in our sins. Have we not? Are we, are we, we're not, we're not, no, we're not continued to be dead in our sins. Have we not experienced being made alive in Christ? Have we not known the, the benefits of his grace and his mercy in our lives? Do we not have our word, our soul nourished by the word of God that we grasp what he has done in our life and what we have ahead in, in eternity? Do we not? Does it weigh, does it weigh heavy on our heart and in our minds and what God has done? What kind of response do we have? Would we prove Chesterton right? Would we, would we prove that other man right? Have we not? Are we not of that of that stripe that has put up, that has done it, that is responding? Because we recognize with a great gratitude the goodness of God and, and his goodness to us, to me. Wow, it ought to, it ought to, it ought to. I'm going to move ahead here. I've got to move ahead. Bottom line is, we need to cease diminishing the value of his calling. We need to remember that we each have a calling to which we've been called. We have been invited into the kingdom of God and the riches and privileges of his kingdom. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 9, he has saved us and called us to a holy, a holy calling. Not according to our works, but according to his purpose. And one thing I love. How many times we hear people talking about, I got to have purpose, I got to have purpose. Well, I tell you, God has a purpose. He has a purpose for you and I. But part of that purpose is that old, flat, that old flesh that still hangs around, that corruptible flesh that still runs around, that, that wants its own way, has to be put to death, has to be put off. That's a work. And that and the only way for that to occur is to put on the opposite, put on humility, put away pride, put away that self-will, and put on Humility, gentleness, he said. And again, that's for next week. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling, a holy calling and a heavenly calling. And finally, Philippians chapter 3, verse 14. Press on toward that goal. Press on toward that goal. Got to go through humility. Got to go through gentleness. Got to go through all these things in our lives. Not to be saved, but to live a life worthy of them in a manner worthy of of that which we've been called. He goes toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I love what I love. It. It's, it's twice in, in uh, Genesis chapter uh, 17 and chapter 35 where, where the Lord uh, just so succinct just lays it all down for, for Moses. He says, or yeah, or for Abraham, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. And then the next one he says, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful. And multiply. God has purpose for us. God will direct our steps. It's interesting in, in uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8, uh, when Abraham was told what to do, we're told to get up and go. go. He'd get up and go, and he went, even though he did not know where he was going. When he was called, when Abraham was called, he got up. It, hey, it didn't call him to put over, and he sat around for 45 years talking about it. 
So when I got the call, I got up and went, even though I didn't know where I was going, because I heard the voice of God, I responded to the voice of God, laid out in Scripture, clear in detail of how we are to live in a manner worthy of the kingdom of God. The failure to follow through in a transition from hearing and knowing the good he has done to a lifelong, lifelong walk in the manner worthy of our worthy of the calling is far too much a reason for our faith to do, ever be weak and our influence on the world to be such such little uh, the, the light and salt that it uh, seems to, to to be. If we fail to feed the inner man that that we would walk in obedience and life and live our lives full of the Spirit of God, that we not carry out those desires of the flesh. Let Jesus dwell within us and live by that only law that we need. We don't do this. We don't do as he says, and we're not going to live that effective life, that fruitful life. We'll walk before him and not as we're, as we're called to do so. And finally, I don't want to be practical here. Paul says, obviously he's insisting, as he always does, that he's holding fast to the truth of God's word. And that's part of why Paul prefaces this with, there's a number of reasons, but this, this, as I always see this, he's a prisoner of the Lord because he spoke. And when he spoke truth, what happened? He used to get flogged, he thrown in jail. All these things occurred to him. Description that description. Why? Because he spoke truth to, to, to crowds. He spoke them to kings. He spoke them to the religious, whether Jew or Gentile. He's speaking to everybody. And even if even if prison was a consequence or a cost, or even his life was, he would never withdraw. He never pulled back from speaking truth. He wasn't seeker friendly. He didn't do it nice and nice and soft and easy for God knows how long. And then all of a sudden, whip out the word. It was part of it. Was part of it. I went, in fact, Acts chapter 20, he went from house to house, speaking all that God has a low counsel of God, never shrinking back from doing so. Bottom line is, one cannot live balancing those scales without incurring the anger and disapproval of men, and that includes even men in the church. He noted being a prisoner in multiple transition points from God's doctrine to the believer's duty in Romans chapter 12, verse 5, Galatians 5, verse 1, Philippians 2, verse 1, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 1, Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. There's a cost that Paul gently reminds them. There will be a cost to you and I accepting what the Lord says and then acting on it because there will be those, wait a minute, that's not my truth. Oprah, you know, Oprah Winfrey told me, your truth is your truth is the most important thing in the world to you. No, it's God's truth. And too many millions, as a matter of fact, hanging on every word Oprah has to say because she's a Christian, you know, and she told me my truth is what's important. No, your truth could lead you to hell. Your truth could lead you to hell. Her truth will lead you to hell. The truth we need, the truth we defend, the truth we use apologetics in is the truth of God. That isn't to be added to or subtracted to. There's a cost, he says, in accepting what the Lord says. The Lord said, look at the world hates me. They're going to hate you. You want to live a God in love in Christ Jesus, you will suffer persecution. There's no way around it. So don't be surprised at the fire ordeals that come upon you. They're going to come. The world hates you even though they might be nice to you for a while, the bottom line is it's in, it's in them who are perishing to hate. When Paul challenged the other gospel and the other Jesus taught in Galatians chapter one, he, he asked them later in chapter five, so have I become your enemy? by telling you the truth. And as the chapter reveals in nine through 11, they had turned back again to be enslaved again by, by the weak and worthless elemental things. In other words, observing days and months and years. I fear for you that perhaps I have labored over you in, in vain. Food, drink, circumcision, adhering to holy days had become essential on parity with the work of Christ, the cross. And of course, all they're doing is nullifying the grace of God by adding all these other things, saying that it wasn't finished at the cross. Adding grace, adding works to grace. No wonder, no wonder Paul says so many times, 
in different ways, but often just that very thing about that fear of a labor in vain. Imagine how Jeremiah, the prophets, felt a labor being in vain. Arthur Pink, one of the most influential and uh, evangelical authors in the uh, first 50 years of the 20th century, uh, 20th century, uh, it says of him in licentious preach, preaching <clears throat> in his writing, he notes the gradual dilution of the word taught from the, from the pulpit. Wow, what a shock, huh? He says, it's because of so many untaught men, unregenerate men, now occupying the pulpits that another gospel is being so widely and generally disseminated. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, for, uh, for a specific. Multitudes have never tasted that the Lord is good, the Lord is gracious, nor have the fear of God, fear of the Lord in them, have from various motives and considerations invaded the sacred calling of ministry. And out of the abundance of their corrupt hearts, they speak. Being blind themselves, they lead the blind into the ditch. Having no love for the shepherd, they have none for the sheep. Being but hirelings, it's a career choice, not a calling. They are, they are themselves of the world, therefore the world hears them. First John chapter 4, verse 5. For they preach that which is acceptable unto fallen human nature, and as like attracts like, they gather around themselves a company of admirers to deceive the unwary, give an appearance of orthodoxy to the, merit, to the message but not sufficient of the truth, especially the searching portions thereof to render to render their hearts uncomfortable by destroying their false peace. They will name Christ, but not preach him. Mention the gospel, but not expound on it. Spurgeon saw this before him a century ago. He says a time will come that instead of shepherding a shepherd feeding the sheep, we will see the clowns entertaining the goats. No wonder Paul begged them to conform to the standard of the word. We have truth today in, that, in the mold of, of, uh, of Oprah. Your truth, your truth, your truth will send you to hell if it doesn't line up with the word of God, if it isn't the truth. Just because someone calls something truth or gospel does not mean it is Jesus, and it surely doesn't mean it's the truth. No wonder Paul grieved. So the outcome is becoming, rather than just renewing our minds to prove the goodness of the will of God, we act on it. We don't have this various shades of gray and in conforming to the world. No clear example of this is what's going on in the marketplace and, in spe and specifically in the political world. Help this old preacher grasp how those claiming to be Christians align themselves with politicians and political parties who speak of values, but embrace and applaud values that collide head on with the word of God, colliding on a collision course with God. How did help me to help me to understand that? So let me ask. Do you vote for a party that is proud of the millions of fully formed unborn babies alive and kicking that are horrifically slaughtered? Do you vote for a party that in California passed a bill that denies it would permit, it denies the reporting that it uh, uh, would permit abortions up to 29 days, yet it removes the abortion from being prosecutable, can't be prosecuted, and permits prosecution against those that actually invest, investigate an abortion. In other words, without directly saying so, infanticide is, effective, is effectively legal up to 29 days. But it won't stop there because evil never does. Evil always flourishes, especially when good men do nothing. So let me ask, do you align with a party that tolerates and encourages the prosecution of those aligned with the, aligned with the Bible, uh, comprised of millions of your Bible-believing brothers and sisters in Christ, who warn of biblical consequences that are devastating to both individuals and nations? Are you not partnering with those who are confiscating property, costing livelihoods, costing jobs, costing careers, and even fostering prison sentences because they dare to intervene in the unnatural behavior or dare to refuse to approve what they know to be wrong? Does it not concern you that the rainbow that God placed 
and the sky following the flood judgment is the same rainbow that today celebrates what God hates? Is there no is there no inner stirring that this bold faced arrogance against the Creator is seeding the very giving over of individuals and nations? So clear in Romans chapter one. I would paraphrase to you what the Pharaoh's servant said to said to the Pharaoh because he refused to let God's people go, give them their deliverance uh, from slavery. And he says, don't you recognize, I'm paraphrasing, don't you recognize you align yourself with those who are destroying the country? Do you not know that you're destroying our country? And in, that, in the context of what I just said, do you not know that you're aligning yourself with those who are trying to destroy our country? Have you ever pondered that many self-righteously condemn Watt? For offering his daughters up to perverts to be raped. Yet we fail to connect the sacrifice of our grade school kids to be taught the superiority of anti biblical, anti biblical perversions of alternate lifestyles and redefinitions of gender that is destro destroying the biblical mooring, moorings and their, and, their, and their futures, all because of the hard choices we didn't make over the years to break that indoctrination. Neither know or a lot greatly affected the world in which they lived, but at least know was a preacher of righteousness. Why Lot was tormented, a man of faith, a righteous Lot, Peter calls him. They had tormented because he had made a compromised decisions early in his life that led him to be where he dwelt in Sodom. Have you considered Paul's references to multiple Old Testament passages? Referenced in the New Testament book in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, it says, Do not be bound, do not be unevenly yoked, do not be aligned with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Well, what agreement has a temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of God. See, it's not Christians who spawn these evils. It's the devil. It's, it's hell that spawns it. If you claim to be called a Christian, you are yoked with, to the devil's schemes here, partnering with biblical lawlessness, fellowshipping with darkness. Where's the harmony there? What does a believer have in common? With deeds of darkness. How could this be walking in a manner worthy of the calling to which we have been called? See, it's long overdue that some need to put up or shut up. Need to start talking to start walking. Later in verse 17, Paul closes his outburst with, had to be emotional, had to be. Therefore, come out from among them. No business there. Be separate. From them. You got nothing in common with them. If you're a believer in Christ, if you're secure in Christ, there's no place. Forget history, forget traditions and all that stuff. Humble yourself. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Come out from among them and be separate, and cease to touch this unclean thing. And I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters to me. It isn't the gospel that fails fails to speak to sin and the consequences of sin. It, it is a subtraction. It is, a, it is omitting. When we admit judgment for sin, we're actually subtracting from the word of God. We're cutting it out. Paul warned in Ephesians 5 and in Galatians 5, when he state, stated in the, in the first book, said the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 6, verse 9, he says, Do you not know? That the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. In that. If so many are. Do not be deceived. That neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, the greedy, nor drunkards, or revilers, or swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you. You were past tense. But you were washed. You were clean. You were made right before God. 
but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God. All those sins may differ in their social and their uh, personal harm or consequence or impact, but a life characterized by these, any of these, is a ticket to hell. I may have become an enemy by telling you the truth, but it isn't love to not tell you the truth that is so plainly written. How many times in scripture we hear of mysteries? There's no mystery here. It's so clear. So clear. The real mystery is, is that we actually have people deceived to think they can partner with the kingdom of darkness that led to Christ paying a just price for our sin that we didn't have to die in our sins. It's time to put up a shut up. It's time to cease conforming to the world, but, the, the, but that there be an actual renewing of our mind by the word of God. By feeding the inner man that we walk by the Spirit. It's past time to be a disciple who doesn't just refer to him as Lord, but submits to him as Lord. That ceases honoring him with their lips, with our lips. And yet our hearts are still far from him. Because he's not dwelling in our hearts through faith. Let's choose to put up. Let's choose to make the transition to walk in a manner worthy of the calling. To which we have been called in Jesus' name. And Father, we, Lord God, I just pray you take your word and sear it to our souls. And Father, to remove any dross of God that I'm responsible for, responsible for. I ask you, oh God, for your tender mercy, grace, Lord, to uh, speak to our souls. Father, give us ears to hear. Father, help us to walk a, word, a, a walk of God that is in obedience to your word. Father, I pray there would be parity and balance in response to what you have done. And Father, we thank you for the goodness, the goodness of God in our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all. God bless you.